Hey everybody, as some of you may know, Rectify Mark II is just over the horizon. So, I decided it was time to give the previous iteration of the design its last send-off. In this video, I will detail the blaster's functions, the design choices that went into it, and the design flaws with the blaster, probably in more detail than you'll find elsewhere. So, let's cut to me and get it hands-on. So? Now that I have the blaster literally in my hands, I'll highlight some of the key external features of the blaster. Something you should notice immediately is the boxy, non-clamshell design of the blaster. This is something many people have described to me as FTL-esque. Of course, many of these similarities are mostly superficial, and if you actually assembled either of them, you'd be able to name off more differences than you could count on your fingers. But there are many lessons to be learned from the FDL platform. For example, one of the benefits of a non-clamshell design was utilized here in the flywheel cage mount. Here, the flywheel cage mounts by bolting directly onto the magwell. This is many fewer points of failure compared to a stock blaster, which mounts on four screw bosses, well, at least in a strife or a rapid strike, on one side of a clamshell. That's all fine on paper until you realize that quite often those parts aren't properly in tolerance. Moving on from that, you'll notice the magwell and the sizable cutout above it. The magwell itself has an integrated flared magwell. It doesn't actually function that well, which is one of the flaws with the blaster. It features a mag release system similar to the caliburn running on an extension spring. And the cavity above allows for the blaster to be top-loaded on the fly, while a magazine is still inserted. This was, in fact, a key factor in designing this blaster. Having top-loading was non-negotiable, as was also having room for a flat top of Picatinny, which you can mount, well, whatever you please, but probably sights on top. Moving on from that, we'll have to look internally onto the blaster. Now for an overview of the internals of the blaster, I thought it would be a whole lot more convenient for me to just view the blaster inside Fusion 360. First, let's start with the pusher box. As you can tell, it is a self-contained unit with a section for an Arduino Smart Car TT gearbox to mount on top of it. Consists of a box and lid and is held on by four screws outside the blaster. Looking inside, you can see that the spinner attaches to the TT box and moves a pusher. This pusher is only 7.5mm wide to reduce the chance of a pusher crash, and also has a dwell to maximize the amount of time for the braking window. And speaking of pusher braking, this is the cycle control system. It mounts on, on a platform, bolted onto the bottom of the pusher group, and uses a sub-mini switch and follower very similar to the rapid strike system. Moving on from that, here is the grip. As you can see, screws run from the pusher group and directly into slots cut out on the side of the grip. It's ergonomically a decent grip, based off a of strife and not that bad, but this mounting solution is incredibly janky, not something I trust to not shear off in a fall, although I haven't actually tested it in such a scenario. The inside of the grip features space and screws for sub-mini and full-size microswitches to bolt on. Now on to the magwell. This is a part that actually takes inspiration from both the Caliburn, the FDL, and the T19. The mag release and retention system is basically repurposed from the Caliburn. There's also this space above for top loading. Moving on from that as well, the wiring run goes through the push group into the carry handle and then into the flywheel cage. The flywheel cage is split into three parts, the flywheel cage itself, the motor cover, and the flywheel cover. The motor cover by default will accommodate anything up to 180 length motors. The flywheel cage itself is designed to accept 130 to 180 size motors, has flywheel removal holes, and accept flywheels up to a 37mm outer diameter. 
I also have options of 43.5, 43, 41.5, and Eclipse spacing options. Also, 14 and 16 millimeter bores for whether you want accuracy or reliability with top loading. Finally, as for the battery tray, the internal battery tray was an afterthought, but what you see here is what it was originally designed for, a stock battery tray with a massive storage volume. But if we look at the internal tray, you can see that it truly was an afterthought. It had to fit in with everything else, and it's actually okay with one major flaw. It cannot fit a pack over 20 millimeters in length, and that's pushing it. That's just one of the many flaws that I've been seeking to address with Rectify Mark II as well. So, now that all of that's been said and done, let's get the blaster on the firing range. Alright, first we'll demonstrate single shots. Now, we'll demonstrate bursts. Now, full auto with what's left. Alright, I'm losing daylight here, quite literally, so I'll wrap up the rest of this video as briefly as I can, while still saying everything that still needs to be said. Really, that's about 11 darts per second or so on a pusher motor that runs at the same RPM as a Michel 2.0. You can do the conversion, as a TT box is a 48 to 1 gear ratio gearbox, so you can just divide the RPM of your motor by 48, that's your rounds per minute, divide it by 60, and that's how many darts per second you'll shoot. So, in conclusion, Rectify was a good learning experience for me to put together, and it'll perform decently on the field. But its execution is just so questionable in so many ways that I've just shown you. I couldn't be happy with it. So, that concludes my documentation of this blaster. Not one it deserved, but one I had to do for myself and anyone with interest in finding out about what comes before this, which I'll show to you later.